Why is everything so dark? I know. Like, what happened? Oh. Oh, shit. Uh, oh, dear. Um, the time has come. To Go on there, YouTube viewer here and we got a good amount of people here today because this time we are doing my belated birthday video out time i know yeah thanks for that <laughs> so as people have known my my topic for our birth this birthday video is going to some of our nostalgia cartoon villains because let's be honest a lot of cartoons have amazing villains let's be honest and how we're going to go off to the order through today because the rule state the birthday guy has to go first so i am first this time around and then second place will actually go choosing off to kevin is going to be second today no Third will actually go to uh, to a to a fellow darkling, uh, Nicholas EDA is third. I gotta take this off. <laughs> Nate, you're gonna be fourth, oh. my friend. All right. And then Ooh. we're gonna go ahead and go through to Trey. He's gonna be uh, he's gonna be after that. Fitting. And then Eric, you're gonna be best for last, buddy. Just don't pull what you did for animes and movies. Yes, please do not be a, don't be a punk and just say I can't choose a number one. They're all that good, please. I no, I, I assure you, I did not this time. Oh, thanks. <laughs> okay, good. If you did, I would have just gone to your house and just punched you. I would have broke down. <laughs> I don't even room. think you know where I live, Kevin. We'll find you. We have a very no. particular set of skills. <laughs> okay, right. okay, down? Liam Neeson. Let's go off to our number 10s. Oh boy, the number 10s are definitely very nostalgic and very, very interesting for me for me on this list because this, this list was definitely something I wanted to do. But the reason why this guy is this low is because he was only in this particular series for a good while, but Cartoon never decided to cancel it because I don't know why. Wait. This actually goes to Argos from the Secret Saturdays. Oh! Oh, wow. Oh, Secret oh, oh, oh. Saturdays. Yeah. Oh, my God. That that was cool. Number 10? Oh, yeah, exactly. Oh. oh. Because, because, piss. because let, let, you have a show that's based on the cryptids and horror, like, monster of legends. That, that just sounds like a great time. It is. And Argos is definitely a good villain. He's he's charismatic. He's suave. He's he thinks ahead of the game, regardless of what the outcome is going to be. The reason why he's just this low is because the series did get canceled, and we didn't really see enough of him later until that cancellation was done. But his design is very nice. He's always like in a, in a robe and a cloak, and he's it's almost like he's, a, he's like hunched back. He's like. Reminiscing of what of the old uh, Nosferatu, Nosferatu, Dracula, anyone you could think of, he kind of reminds you of that body style, and the dialogue he has is so good, especially on his own TV show. <laughs> that was actually really funny. <laughs> but regardless, okay, though, the Secret Saturdays is the underrated TV show. That I wish could come back. I don't, but Cartoon Network has been weird the, during the the later. Uh, last half of the 2010s so i don't know why but secret saturdays did stick out to me and argos is definitely a major villain to have to that so yeah secret saturdays is starting off this villain list right here number 10 
Mm. Sorry. <laughs> so, Kevin, your turn for number 10. Well, it's time for our first tie. Oh, a tie? A tie to start off. <laughs> you fools think you can outrank me for my videos, but I, Mojo Jojo, can be superior than you. You are nothing but inferior. Oh my God, look at you, this. <laughs> yes. Mojo Jojo. From Powerpuff Girls, yes. Oh, and, classic. Wow, Nicholas just got salty. You right, don't better. like him? And also, all right, well, speaking of salt, this salt's what is the main ingredient for this character from this show, another Cartoon Network show. A classic that I like and Nicholas likes. And while she's not a villain villain, she's still villainous in her own way. So number my tie with Mojo Jojo. And die from Chowder. Really? What the fuck? Oh, what? The Wait, you mean the guy that was a uh, did you mean the girl that woman that had a crush on Schnitzel? Yes. Yeah. The <laughs> woman, <laughs> the, the woman who, who the oh, woman no, no. Who, Are we who, sure that was a woman? Are we sure that was a woman? That's what I well, want to know. Well, she had tits, so yes. <laughs> and the biggest dumb truck in cartoon. No, 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 no. No, that's that's <laughs> the best part about her is that she her sizes are as inconsistent as Gamagori from Kill a Kill. Yeah. Wow. This is anyway. almost enough to make up for choosing Mojo Jojo over him. I know, right? Oh, you bitches! All right, well, let's start with Mojo Jojo. Oh man, Powerpuff Girls was fun. It was a fun show, you know. But we get female representation as many characters, you know, Blossom Bubbles and Buttercup. I would say Bubbles was my favorite all the time. They were great characters and they had a lot of villains. They gave Batman and Rogue's Gallery a run for their money in terms of craziness. Mm -hmm. And Mojo Jojo, he was good. I, I liked him. I mean, he had this connection to the Powerpuff Girls, you know, being the monkey that Professor Plutonium had, you know, being that lab rat. And when the accident that made the Powerpuff Girls happen, happened. <laughs> He was affected too, giving him super intelligence, which for some reason grows his brain out of his head. And he had to make a helmet. It was just, it was weird. It was, but then again, it's Cartoon Network, so why not? They, they tend to get away from weird shit. So, in a way, you, you kind of feel bad for Mojo because he's pretty much been outcast by his father, you know, for these three girls. So, yeah, you feel sorry for him until you realize he's completely psychotic and wants to rule the world with apes. I mean, the first Powerpuff Girls movie, come on. Yeah. Like, him as the villain, oh. was, it was good. I liked that movie. And having fucking Mojo Jojo have a literal army of apes was crazy. We're not just going to talk about the fact that he's a lame version of Gorilla Grodd? Mm, that is actually true. But nice. still, like, he, he's smart in his own way. Like, all the inventions he's made are impressive. He's just dumb. He's just so dumb. No common sense at all. And uh, in a cartoony way. I love his inconsistent talks. You know, he always refers to himself as the third person. It, it was just funny, you know? It, the, the only reason he's like number 10 right here is because I don't remember him that much, but I know he's fucking crazy. Now let's move on to End Guy. <laughs> oh, look, look. I just started rewatching Chowder before this video, so she's on my mind. And it's. It's just not that she's a villain. She's not a villain, but she's a really antagonistic to Mung. I mean, come on. She's always trying to one-up him. Like in episodes like when he lost his license, the apprenticeship award, uh, the apprentice tournament with her apprentice Panini, and especially when mm -hmm. she just, no, Schnitzel. Wait, what's up, uh, Nicholas? No, I just, I'm just reminding that. Remember that. <laughs> uh... Yeah, she just... It's, it always feels like she's just a spoiled sport that will always do everything in her power to just fuck with Mong, you know? And the fact that the show goes as far as to describe her as a fucking mountain that Mong and Chowder have to climb. <laughs> it was so funny. And it the was they... dumb, but it worked. <laughs> yeah. And her crush on Schnitzel. Guys, are, you, are we sure that's not technical race? <laughs> Oh my god, that episode. Uh, I don't really Dude. want to dive in down that rabbit hole. Let's not talk about that, please. Yeah, it but, weird yeah. The first half, but it got emotional in the second half. Yeah, but yeah, it's just. And I'm not a bad villain, but she's kind of a bad person. So that's why she emoji are kind of number 10. <laughs> All, All right. Please don't, please don't kill me. Dang. All right, wow. EDA. Your turn Can for you number 10. 
you've forgotten something I told you a long time ago. One of the painful truths of comedy. You always take shots from people you who just, just don't, don't get the joke. joke. <laughs> you what? fucker. And you fucker. don't call me Puddin. Yes, oh. the 90s Joker from the you Batman animated trilogy. You hypocritical piece of shit. You don't oh. get pissed. You don't wait, get wait, pissed wait, wait, at wait, me. Wait, 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 one second. Did he put Mark Hamill's rendition of the Joker from the DCAU at number fucking Yes, he 10? fucking did, bro. <laughs> Obviously, uh, he did this to fuck with us. If you're going to do that character, you better give him. Never mind. Can I explain myself first, please? Yeah. Before you kill me? Yeah. Okay, look, he's only number 10 because. Comics came first. He's not completely cartoon original. That's the only reason. That's the only reason, okay? That's fair. All right, understandable. Yeah. Oh, I almost didn't put him on the top 10 at all because of that fact. That, that would have been worse. That's what I did. Exa exactly. Straight I'm not. Shit. I'm insane. I'm not stupid. <laughs> I mean, I you want to talk about taking a role and making his own? This clown is. Crazy, but then again, it is the Joker, so why should we expect anything less? Every scheme he's in is insane, it's over the top, it's goofy. I still remember when he tried to blow up a casino just because it made fun of his image. Yeah, <laughs> thinking about a second, but the, I say he's part of the trilogy because of one thing the return of the Joker yeah. in Batman yeah. Beyond. Yeah. That's the him at peak. To me, okay. He, I love that, and I also love that he just broke down when he started getting heckled. It was like, oh, you, he can dish it out, but he can't take it, which is perfect for him. But yeah, cartoon villain number ten is Joker, only because he's not cartoon original. Please okay. don't kill me. Please don't kill me. <laughs> we'll see how the other list go. So, so go ahead, Nate. How do you have, how do you have your ten? Well, for my number 10, I, well, let's get into tone drama for this one. Like, oh. even some of them may be hateable. Some of them could be good villains. Ooh. But I only had to choose one. I almost went with Alejandro. He's actually one of my favorite villains from the OG. Yeah. But after much considerations, I decided to talk about Scott. Oh, that God, the, yeah, the that white guy. trash. The white trash boy. Yeah. Oh, fuck Scott. <laughs> fuck him. Fuck him as a character, too. <laughs> oh, someone got salty. He got, <laughs> he got done and be booted. Those two were great. Yeah, I I know Trey. I know that's why I had to add him on the list. Cause don't get me wrong, all the other villains are good. Though still fuck Courtney. But anyway, if there's one thing I will admit, Heather, Justin, for some reason, Alejandro, they all do one thing: flirt. That kind of got old by the time the season three came around. So when Scott came into the picture, I wonder how he's going to handle being a villain. And his plan is to lose on purpose. So the other team will get a false sense of security. And that way he could take them all down. Honestly, that's a very effective strategy. And it worked for most of the time. I mm -hmm. fully expected him to fail like after like the third challenge or something because I was like, there's no fucking way this character is going to last that long. He almost made it to the fucking finale. How the Yeah, he almost made it to the top three. That, I don't know how that happened. Yeah, uh, I was just surprised too. Like he did got B voted off. He got Don voted off. And he got a lot of people voted off, even Mike. When he found out about Mike's multiple personality disorder, he took advantage of it. And when he got immunity, <laughs> thanks for telling me the victory. Goodbye. Yeah. Man. It just shows that Scott is the one villain I remember that doesn't flirt. He uses his own cunniness. Even though he does get chased around by Fang a lot. <laughs> like, cunniness or just talking about sheer dumb fucking luck? It could be either one, but yeah, the reason why I had Scott so low on my list is I'm not going to beat around the bush. He became a freaking dipshit in All-Stars. Uh, All-Stars as a whole was trash. All-Stars was bad. 
It was, it no, was it wasn't bad, bad Brandon. It was okay. It the only reason it's not the worst season is because one thing, Pocketel Island. Mm, that oh God! Oh, yeah. Or yeah. one thing I will say that I actually didn't like about All Stars was Duncan and Zoe's dynamic with each other. I don't know. I just uh, feel like they had a good inter uh, uh, inter moments, interactions and moments with each other. That's like true. while while Duncan's sudden uh, nice guy tendencies did feel like it came out of nowhere. I wouldn't have minded that kind of character progression because we've seen those kind of moments before in the past. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, so even though, like, Scott is a complete dipshit in season five and he got downgraded, I will admit, he did make me laugh a couple of times in that season. I will admit, he he could be a bit comedic now and then. So, yeah, it's, <laughs> Scott, he has to go here right on number 10. Thank God he didn't flirt in his debut. Oh, season. motherfucker, I just realized he's the one contestant that's always in the final four. Oh, yeah, he is. Yeah. Like, he got fourth place in Revenge of the Island, and he got third in All-Star. Surprise! Oh, fourth. Oh, fourth. yeah, third. Never mind. Yeah. All righty. Well, Trey, what do you got to keep this uh, crazy train going? <laughs> I swear to God. Easy. Come on. Come to my assistance and credit. Wait, what? What's your... I'm not calling you... Fine, whatever. Come to my assistance. Syndrome. What? The fuck? I almost called him incredible. It was a joke. Oh. Oh, shit. shit. Wait, wait, wait. Should we have kept the list to only cartoon, like cartoon shows and movies? Yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Hey, whatever. If EDA can include the fucking Joker, who's a comic book villain, I, I should be. Anything could be possible. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. fair. That's fine. Yes. So, Syndrome. <laughs> Okay, I did. Uh, I'm. I'm gonna be honest. I did not expect to like this character. I didn't even expect him to become the main villain. Like that. That was a. That was actually a really good twist. That was actually. Set I agree. Up. Like, did any of us see him coming? Really? No. 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 no, no. Wait. No. No. You mean you didn't see that coming? <laughs> no. No. Well, basically, if Chekhov's gun was to have a, a picture or a portrait, uh, syndrome would be it. Because damn, does he come back in a good way. He uses the technology that we see established in the very first shots as its prototype, shoddy work, etc. We see his motivation straight up uh, for becoming a villain, like uh, incredible uh, rebuffing him as just a simple fanboy and not uh, acknowledging his potential or whatever. And then so when, he fi when we finally do see him where he currently is, it makes sense. You know, he's a genius with technology, so it makes sense that he will get a, he will end up becoming rich sometime down the future. He has a grudge against Mr. Incredible and superheroes by extension, so it makes sense that he would do all this to superheroes just to prove a point that you don't need powers to become a superhero. And I like how he's a twist on that kind of trope, because usually it's the good guys who are like, you know, you don't need powers to be a superhero. No, he takes that concept and makes it evil that no, that uh, having powers itself, if everyone was to have some kind of equivalent to it without powers, no one would be super. Mm -hmm. and that's a good philosophy to have. And I like how he kind of parodies the whole traditional uh, villain trope. Like you even see it with himself. He's even aware of it. He's like, son of a bitch, you got me monologuing. Like he's aware of the role he plays and he chews up the scenery too. And to be honest, he only loses because he was arrogant. Like, that's oh, really yeah. And he's played by, and he's voiced by one of the king of fanboys, Jason Lee. Yeah. <laughs> like, never forget his role in Mall Rats. Carry on. Also, his technology is really freaking cool. Like, just his stasis technology is so overpowered. I don't think there's an actual weakness for it besides catching him off guard. Like, that's literally it. That's Those are the only ways he's ever been beaten. Like, he's been caught off guard uh, nearly by Mr. Incredible himself. He was caught off by his own adaptoid robot. He was caught off by Jack-Jack, which admittedly, to be fair, everyone would have been caught off by guard by Jack-Jack. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, I was surprised too. <laughs> and oh, also yeah. that a little bit of, and also his ironic fate. Yeah, he whined like a baby this whole damn time, so it makes sense that his doom would be at the hands of a super baby. And not to <laughs> mention oh, the one quoting that screwed him over. Right. No, and not just a baby, a super baby with pretty much all the powers. He went on about how you don't need power, so it makes sense he will be killed by potentially the most powerful character in this franchise. Who pretty much has the powers of Metamorpho. I know. that It's ridiculous. <laughs> but yeah, he's number 10, though, because like while I love this role uh, as a character, he wasn't really 
charismatic to me or he didn't really have anything that necessarily endeared me to him. Like he's solely here because he played his role that good. Okay. That's fair. Also because how he, but also the way he started off as an entitled fanboy, like you said. Honestly, right. you know, I just realized I think he's he made before Modoc, he was the one that made the first adaptoid. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. All righty. Eric, how do you round up round number ten? I would have hold the banana. What? What? Eris from Billy and Mandy. <laughs> Oh, seriously? <laughs> yes, I, oh put her, God, I put her number 10. The goddess? The, the wow. goddess, goddess of, with the the goddess of chaos. Dude, what well, the more fuck? specifically, the Greek goddess of chaos. Of all things, Eric, I fucking explain for you, please. I, I was not explaining. Well, one, to kind of piss you off. <laughs> and two, two, because she's based off of a Greek mythological goddess. So it's like, that's... It's it's not it's it's too easy. So like pretty much her motivation is simple, just like every other Billy and Mandy villain that's like freaky or or creepy or whatever. Except Eris is a little more classy in how he chooses to conduct chaos, and that's usually done with the apple of discord. And also, it, I find it funny how she acknowledges her own chaotic nature. Because I wish most women would, but to the point where she will even date Haas, who she says puts brings order in her chaotic world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the reason I put her on the list compared to some of the other almost one note Cartoon Network villains is because, um, much like a lot of the self-referential, self-aware nature of the cartoon villains. Um, she has like a lot of charisma and personality in how she conducts herself. Mm. Like, um, like, like, especially um, the season four episode where she does give the apple to Billy, Mandy, and Grim. Like, wait, what's the catch? What? There's no catch. The world is chaotic enough. <laughs> and ladies, speak the truth. Uh, she's right about that one. The world is already chaotic enough as it is. But yeah, number ten, Eris. Consider it her last hoorah. Hoorah! <laughs> of all, th and oh of all things, of all things, Billy broke her. Dude, Billy breaks everybody, even Gladys. I was actually half tempted to put Gladys on the list, but Eris oh. was just more charismatic. That's <laughs> great. Yeah. All right, this, <laughs> this birthday video is off to a great start. I love it. Great start, give me a salty start. Hey, and exactly. I had Endai from Chowder, so <laughs> that's that's why that's why I want. I want the salt to flow. All right, so number nine for me. We're gonna go to one of the best shows of Nickelodeon. He's a phantom. Get a phantom. Butterfucker. <laughs> Look at but <laughs> let's go. Let's go to probably the best one he has. You may call you may call me Vlad Plasmius. Oh, is <laughs> look at me. Are you okay, buddy? Yeah. Vlad Plasmius <laughs> is number nine. He's number uh, nine. Okay? Yes. Maybe? Because Who the fuck, dude. Simple. He has one. He has one agenda. Let's be honest, guys. Come on. He's pretty basic. He's pretty basic. He's a fruit but loop. I am not a fruit loop. The fruit loop says. I swear to God, this guy. Friends to Jack and. Is it Jack? That was, Jack was his best friend. And an accident happened. He gave, got ghost power from echo, echno acne. Yeah. But let's be honest. His powers and his design, it's better than Danny's. Ten times oh, yeah, better. without a doubt. Yeah, basically, cool. a ghost Dracula. That's basically his design, oh, and yeah. just the the charismatic things he he does, like trying to take uh, to basically trying to take Jack's wife away from oh, him. Oh, Ma like, Madison. Yeah, Madison, Madison away away from him just because he felt betrayed and like ruined his life because of that accident. And that's basically his gimmick throughout the entire show. But also, what probably got him. A little bit more intriguing was that he actually tried to make his own child with Danny's cousin. I was like, oh, yeah, that... "Damn, dude, that's and, desperate." And especially when he when he wasn't even he didn't really make a joke a lot. And it's like 
in his dialogue, like, sorry, Daniel, funny joke around Vlad isn't here today. And I was like, wow, so he, he can be serious. I like that. But then the last season comes out. And oh, yeah. Yeah. What, was it necessary for him to reveal himself that late in the series? Because it just ends right after that. Was it that necessary? No. I would have but, done that like the the second to last season. But it it was also why he's this loose because he does he does kind of branch towards helping out Danny every now and then, especially like with the uh, the episode with the Ghost King, getting him back to the crypt and all that. So he does venture from villain to antihero sometimes, not all the time. I'm gonna be perfectly honest. Oh yeah. He only ventures into that territory when it's to benefit himself. Yeah. But yes, again, why he's this low is because he, his character is pretty basic. The 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 uh, motivation he has it is kind of I, ironic, even though his his dynamic with Danny is definitely some of the highlights of the show. It's really good to see those two. So even though it may be a uh, mad be like I'm portraying him, but Black Plasmius is honored enough, enough to be on my list, even though it's this low. So that's why he had to go with number nine. That goddamn Fruit Loop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. A uh, word of advice: if you have to clarify, you're not a Fruit Loop. You are a Fruit Loop. And mm-hmm. trust me, I'm speaking from experience. So, so you've been a Fruit Loop? Exactly. Mm-hmm. I knew it. I knew something was fruity about it, Nicholas. <laughs> go to your number nine, weird, Kevin, Kevin, before I kill right. you. Yeah. <laughs> oh fuck no! All right. Uh, this number nine originally his character was higher but then i kind of lowered him <clears throat> what? Uh, okay it's evil morty from rick and morty evil oh, morty. morty he was trying to sing the tune i can't yeah. okay fuck off anyways <laughs> yeah, see he can't even do it he's <laughs> Okay, go. Oh, you called my bluff. Yeah, anyways, so yeah, Evil Morty. Um, yeah, this was not expected. This was not expected at all in the series. I mean, we just thought Evil Morty was a pretty much a sidekick of Evil Rick, who was a very bland villain, a forgettable one. And then at the end of the episode, when Evil Rick died, it's revealed that he was a puppet. And the real controller was e- the Evil Morty. Like, that was an interesting twist. I didn't think the show would actually delve deep into this. Like when we get to that episode in season three with the Citadel, we see like this Morty being uh, for the Morty campaign. We think, okay, good way to show the sh- show oh the other Mortys and Ricks of the multiverse. And then near the episode, near the episode, we realize, holy shit, this is evil Morty. You know, with his black suit and everything, because he orchestrated everything. He orchestrated his own assassination. He orchestrated that. The, that the news Morty who was working for him got killed. He ensured mm-hmm. that every Rick and Morty will live peacefully. Like, dude, he's literally like a puppet master. And his theme is pretty fucking good. I love his theme. It, it feels so ominous. And the fact that he even makes fun of the whole, like, villain cliche speeches, like his syndrome, it was pretty good. You know, I like that. Then season... Wait, are we on season five? Yeah, that's just yeah, we pass season five. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So past season five, we get Rick meeting Rick and Morty meeting Evil Morty, and we tr- we learned that he's done. He's done. He doesn't want to be part of this whole continuum of Rick's and Morty. He doesn't want to do that. Literally, that's what Morty said. What are you gonna do? Yeah, shit. I'm leaving. Like literally, that's it. He's leaving. He's done. He doesn't want to do this. Yet at the end, he becomes the thing he hates, Rick. In a way, he thinks like a Rick. So that's that's an interesting thing, you know? Because people think, oh, you know, there's this theory that Rick was a Morty and stuff. So I don't know. Like, even Morty could prove that. Like, I just like his, spe- his like, calm demeanor and everything. It just feels nice. The only reason number nine is because I wavered with Rick and Morty. I don't hate it, but it's, like, it's kind of overrated. So, yeah, number nine is even Morty. Are we not going to talk about how fucked up his escape plan from the Citadel was? Yeah, that's true. He yeah, was caused up. carnage. Yes. <laughs> I did not think that they could get away with that much violence, but goddamn. It's Rick and Morty. What the fuck? Yeah, yeah, but that was on a level I did not expect. 
Okay, well. All righty. Oh. Well, what is your number nine, though, EDA? All right. Uh, we've talked about Cartoon Network. We've talked about Nickelodeon. We've talked about Adult Swim. Let's go to the other one. Other one? What? It's a Disney villain. Oh. oh okay. Wait, is it Hades? As much as I want to, no, because I was only doing cartoon shows. Oh. oh. So, well, so this one goes to the Dark Dragon from Jake Long. Oh, oh shit. <laughs> the Avengers Endgame villain. Holy shit. Wow. Yeah. I mean, uh, first of all, Dark Dragon, right off the bat, the name alone gets you points. Second of all, I love the design of it. Although I do question season two of it. Seriously, what the fuck happened to that animation style in season two? I don't know. They, they, uh, someone got it wrong. That's what happened. Yeah. I mean, he's he basically wants to commit genocide on the entire human race. He's to create a pure world for magical creatures. And I'm like, uh, yeah, I've seen this song and dance before. It doesn't end well for you. Somebody nope. always stops it. <laughs> and I mean, the guy is freaking, he's cunning, he's clever, he's goddamn powerful. I mean, but what I don't get is why does he always go out like a bitch every time? I mean, season one, he gets crushed by like eye bars or something. And then season two, he's stuck in a portal for like 10,000 years or something. Come on, dude. You gotta be better than that. But yeah, I don't remember. Remember what he can do. I don't remember him that well, but, but that's just on my memory, not on the show. He was I thought he was pretty damn good. Dark Dragon. Wow. Right there. All righty. <laughs> All righty, Nate. What do you got? Well, let's go back to Cartoon Network villains, because even some of them, even in modern times, they can have some pretty good villains. <laughs> Until we meet again, Mystery Incorporated. Um, Mr. Shen. Huh? What? No. Professor Pericles from Scooby-Doo Mystery, Inc. The freaking parrot? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Looks can be deceiving. No shit. <laughs> yeah. For a parrot, he is one of the smartest villains I've seen. Like, he used to be a part of the original Mystery, Inc. And good friends with Ricky Owens. But after after the events, he became corrupted. Was, oh, man. We didn't get to see him much of him for most of season one, which is why I can only put him so low. That I can barely remember him. It's been a long time since I've seen that cartoon. But even with that, he's still one smart bird. Literally, around the end of season one, he started gathering the pieces. He was able to outsmart Mystery Inc. a couple of times. He was able to use his old partners to make him look like, well, Fred and Daphne. And let me just say, he could be quite sadistic, putting in like some kind of like nanotag into his former partner that paralyzes him. Oh. That's what happened? Yeah. Yeah, in season I two. Honest, I, I gotta be honest, I fell out of that show. And that's understandable. Oh, welcome back, Trey. Uh, um, anyway, but for Professor Pericles, even with that, he still has other plans. I mean, in season two, I remember that one dark moment where he had his henchmen fire a freaking rocket missile at the helicopter. And it actually killed Nova. <sighs> that was dark, even for a cartoon. And I will admit, around the season finale of season two, when he became a freaking Kraken of all things, I'm like, the fuck am I even looking? Honestly, what yeah. The, the fuck? The uh, <laughs> Mystery Inc. went too much into the supernatural stuff. Yeah, it went too much in the second season. It, it was just ridiculous. But even with that, Professor Pericles, it actually shows that he's quite threatening for a bird. He's very intelligent. And kind of sadistic too. Even I had to admit. Yeah. Well, That's birds aren't the well, birds aren't the last living descendant of dinosaurs, so of course they're going to be fierce. Oh yeah, exactly. People say that <laughs> a falcon or like 
of vultures are deadly, well, let's just say don't run into this parrot. That's my number nine. All righty. So, Trey, go ahead, my friend. I'm just in time to uh, reintroduce you to a pretty surprising villain that I'm pretty sure none of you remember. <clears throat> the original candidate for the Grim Reaper, Velma Green, the Spider Queen. Oh, the I remember her. I remember her. Velma Green, the Spider Queen from Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. Oh, her. Jeff's Pride, remember? Oh, yeah, now I remember her. <laughs> She was okay. I did not expect to like her or actually be engaged in her backstory with Grimm. It's like okay to know that Grimm, the role of Grim Reaper, was something that could be selected. That's a good bit of world building right there, even mm -hmm. though it's a Cartoon Network cartoon, so that plot point probably got dropped. But either way, though. It was a nice, interesting fact about how, you know, you get to see a younger Grimm, how insecure he used to be as a child. And it's like, it's a nice uh, little dichotomy between how he is and how he is then. But to learn that he had a more confident and scarier best friend, that was a fucking spider woman of all things. She was literally arachne for crying out loud. Yep. And this is when I was, when I was a kid and I hated spiders. I still hate spiders, but I hated them even more then. And I'm like, no, I am so glad we had a skeleton as a Grim Reaper instead. But to learn about how she felt cheated out of her role and she came back to get revenge on Grim, and like, she fucking almost wins too. Yeah. Like, I mean, even though we see Grim get his ass kicked a lot, I don't think we've seen it like to that extent, except for like the bounty hunter dude or whatever. Or oh. like, usually they, uh, Gr uh, usually Grim ends up getting tricked, but. Oh, my number nine is uh, Velma Green, the Spider Queen from uh, Grim Adventures of Billion. Oh, you motherfucker. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Moving on from that. Uh, and after that, though, like how when she, her response to learning the truth, she's like, oh, we're cool. So I'm just going to go ahead and take over the world now. Just and, like Daddy wanted. <laughs> exactly. And she went, like, she literally went, like, I don't even fucking know how they actually got her to go back down. I would have loved to see her as a recurring character. Agreed. I'm surprised they didn't do that. Yeah. Like, Jesus Christ. Like, although I hate Jeff, I hate Jeff on principle. I'm sorry. He's a nice dude, but I just hate him. I can't like spiders. I liked her. She was cool. So, yeah, that's my number nine. All right. Wow. <laughs> Eric? And yes, I can read your thoughts, Dexter, and I am smarter than you. What? Mandark from Dexter's Laboratory. Oh my god. Oh, my god. Uh, wait, what was that middle finger for? <laughs> yeah, what was that middle finger for? <laughs> hate, I hate that guy. Me oh, too. There's a, well, there's a reason I put him on the list. I hate him too. <laughs> I don't think there's a single person on the planet that likes that fucker. <laughs> hey, EDA, 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 who is more annoying, Monoma or Mandark? Uh, guys? <laughs> so Mandark, because of that fucking laugh. Okay, but the reason I put him <laughs> a little higher, the reason I put him higher on the list is because well, actually, here the reason I put him on the list is because, um, what was it? He's literally like the because he's the antithesis to Dexter, the yin to Dexter's yang, and his literally his one objective is just to destroy Dexter's lab and rule the world, and. Especially also the first sister. Oh yeah, and to Dee Dee. Oh yeah. Who, who, who in the entire cartoon is the living embodiment of chaos for for our two boy geniuses here. <laughs> um, but yeah, like even in the first episode when we see him, like he's been shown to outshine Dexter to some degree. But the one part where he fails every single time is when it comes to Dee Dee. He will literally simp for DD yep. and of all the and of all the cartoon simps compared to um Erwin from Billy and Mandy or Millhouse from Simpsons, Mandark simping is just more entertaining. Oh yeah. <laughs> Wasn't it like an uh, episode where he took it too far? <laughs> yes. I, but at least he succeeded in getting a dance with the girl. I can't say the same for Millhouse or Erwin, who are just fucking losers. Uh. <laughs> um but then like as the seasons go on or whatever, he's definitely a big bad for Dexter. Like, holy shit. Like, 
he was able to go back and he was able to go back in time and shit and then you figured out that in the future he did destroy the laboratory and he did rule the world but as disembodied but as a um oh wait actually before i get to that part um did he save the world with her chaotic nature somehow in that future she reversed the flow of, of for the what, what was it? The, the the neutron core? The positive? I think it was whatever that. it was. I don't remember. What, whatever it was. She literally just reversed the polarity of of that device and just destroyed Mandark and turned him into a disembodied brain, turning him into brain dark. <laughs> that, that, like, so that it's is, just a huge what the fuck. Like, come on. I was as a kid, I was like, this cartoon is dark and this this cartoon is dark enough, but holy shit, that was freaking dark <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh my god but yeah and also like he and similarly to dexter he also makes the the nerd like the physical like nerd stereotype like that much more entertaining him mean, you're talking about a tall kid with a bull cup for crying out loud <laughs> hey eric you think yeah. he inspired that rival character in the orange jumpsuit from despicable me <laughs> Oh, yes. Baxter. Oh. So yeah, number nine, Man Dark or Brain Dark, whichever timeline you're looking at. <laughs> All righty. So we're going on to number eight now. This guy is definitely one of my childhood favorites, but he's only with this low because he's also like some of the other ones. He's pretty, his goal is basic, but can we all shout it out? Cobra! What? Oh. Cobra Commander from G.I. Joe. Oh. Wait, 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 wait. Brandon, 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 Brandon. No. What is your preferred oh. mask for Cobra Commander? Oh. Um, the uh, the, the, sil the silver faced one. Always. Thank God, because if you had said the blue mask, I would have fucking murdered you. Whoa! <laughs> okay, calm the fuck down. Why are we getting so slow? Because that blue mask is just an Obama fucking nation. It's stupid. That's what it is. Okay, let's go yeah, on. Cobra Portrait. Commander. This guy, the leader of the terrorist organization Cobra. Literally, the, or the organization that hides in the shadows and waits to strike, like an actual snake. But this guy, this guy is over the top. He doesn't care what happens. He wants to rule the world, no matter what. We've seen that. I've seen that many, many times in all, every villain backstory for cartoons. But it's also they gave him some more backstory in the show for GI Joe. Even though it was kind of weird, though he he came from a place called called Snake Rilla, and he was a snake person. And then they turned to a snake. Then he turned back again because of. Baroness's black magic. I don't know what the fuck was going on with that one. The eighties was weird. Uh, the eighties was and weird. You said that, and you said that Mr. Ink went too far with supernatural. This is also guilty too. No, yeah, the eighties was weird, man. The eighties was weird. <laughs> but it was also like the the idea of having Cobra Commander be this uh, like almost like a Starscream kind of character, even though it's ironic because the original voice actor for Cobra Commander was also Starscream in the original Transformers TV show. Yep. So that kind of fits and i just love cobra commander's design throughout all other mediums that he's in from whether it's animation to video games to the live action performances even though retaliation was horrible i'm just late late Retali uh... yeah, retaliation was horrible the design for cobra commander was good but the story was stupid i mean how can you go from like the idea of duke's best friend who is a fiance revealed to be Cobra Commander to like just a regular, a regular like mind, mind bomb. What the fuck you guys ever doing? But it was also just, it's, I don't know what it is, but like almost every animation he's in, he's voiced by someone who's also done Starscream in, in the, in whatever show he's in. What is that connection? I don't get it. Maybe but, he'll be Starscream in the future or something. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, he, they already, in the original Transformers cartoon, they actually had him made him a guest appearance in one of the episodes, and he tried to say Cobra in the end <laughs> of the episode, but he coughed. Oh, that one. That was, 
that was just kind of fun. I, I, that's just nostalgic having it's, two shows that have the same nature in that. So yeah, hopefully, I even though I'm not putting a lot of expectation for it, Hasbro did say they want to redo the GI Joe movies because after the first two and Snake Eyes was a total flop, they were gonna like try and redo it. So I'm not gonna put any expectations for it, but. Cobra Commander is just one of those iconic villains you see in any like like uh, toy store or comic book, video game. He's just that iconic. The Silver Mask is always something you would remember. And I, he's also, I've seen a lot of cosplayers do a really good job at, as him. So Oh yeah, very good. So yeah, Cobra Commander from G.I. Joe is my number eight spot. Please don't worry me, Trey, if I did say the blue mask. <laughs> Go ahead, Kevin. What is your number eight? Whatever. This song sucks. Heather from Total Drama. <laughs> oh, I kind of thought we were going to see her somewhere. <laughs> the OG. Um, um, okay, so there are a lot of good villains in Total Drama. You know, Alejandro was good. Um, Scott was good. Uh, the Ice I Dance even like the Ice Dancers, too. Like, yeah, I was gonna mention, the Ice Dancers were pretty good, even though they were really douchey. Rush people yeah. are very effective. But let's just talk about the OG. Let's give respect to this bitch queen, okay? Because, wow. Does Tyler take the term white trash to a whole other level? Like, wow. She, like, when she gets on the on the other what does she do? Blairs at everyone. Says she, my parents didn't arrange this. It just, it just shows that she was privileged. And she actually knew how the game went. She knows how something like this goes like how game shows go that there's gonna be alliances that you know they'll take majority votes so what she do she makes her own alliance with of all people <laughs> Lindsay and beth yeah because both of them are dumb so they're very <laughs> easy to manipulate i know i know but it's like you she could play the in the innocent person pretty well like we've seen that she's manipulated votes before you know against Beth against uh, Izzy against a lot of characters, even Trent. Oh my boy, Trent! Oh, but, that episode, dude! Oh. Like she is manipulative. Like every time she tries to find a way to punish her team because she's the team leader. Like it's interesting, you know. Especially like during the when they were had the merger. Like she tried to manipulate them again, but everyone kind of saw her bullshit. And when Lindsay cursed her off, oh, oh my god. Dude, the sensors are fucking hilarious. It's well, like it's... Whoa, a stuck up little. <laughs> just, everyone's just like, everyone's I... horrified. I'm like, whoa, what is Lindsay saying? It it was just funny. Uh, and... I even love how Duncan of all people who hits I had it a few times. He was like, ooh, that's cold, that's bro. cold, bro. Yeah, exactly. He's like, like, I'm all with people. people. Yeah, yeah. yeah at least exactly. I'm honest about it. And then, my God. The... I triple dog dare you was one of the closest <laughs> episodes, but it felt fucking therapeutic. It was cathartic because my favorite character was winning the whole time, and my least favorite character was constantly getting exactly. dumped on. Wait, like, wait, are you talking no. about Gwen? No, Owen. Yes. Owen. Owen was awesome. Yeah, Owen's was just, great. But just he like, deserved, I love... deserved to be on All Stars or shit as that season was. I know. I know. Well, he. I mean, technically, he was there. Trey. He's going to be a contestant. Or a funny cameo. <laughs> oh, but still, it was just it was just fun to see Heather fucking lose everything because she didn't do a challenge because of a technicality. She didn't willingly do the haircut. It was funny. <laughs> and okay, well, she has kind of toned down the villainy per se. She's still bitch. So yeah, uh, number eight is Heather. Although she and Alejandro make the most chaotic pairing ever. Yeah, and it works oh too. Oh my god. <laughs> Heather's right, one weakness, Alejandro. Number eight, buddy. All right, we're finally going to get serious again. Greetings and beyond the new. I am VV Argos. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Argos. Argos. What? Oh. He's got company. What? Oh. oh, it was first day. It seems Rex's nanites have the opposite effect on me. <gasps> he cures Evos. I create them. Van Kleiss from oh, Generator Rex. Oh, that's oh. why he got bad earlier. Oh. <laughs> All right. First, 
let's talk Argos because Brandon touched on a lot of things, but you missed that one thing. And that twist. That's where what, it's yes. revealed oh. that he's a motherfucking Yeti. Mm-hmm. Nobody saw that coming. Nobody. And then when he gains the powers of the anti curve yeah. Wow, oh, man. It literally became a battle of opposites. And he literally launched a war of cryptids. It was that, what I just said, a war between cryptids. That is one of the coolest fucking ideas ever. And I am fascinated by this stuff. And I also just loved how he went out because he spent his whole life trying to obtain the power of Kerr. And he finally got it only for it to destroy him. Mm-hmm. That is just perfect. That's how you end this guy out. Now let's talk Kleiss. Yeah. First of all, that hand. That is terrifying. It just It literally looks like a five syringes. And it's just ready to stab into your chest, twist and rip out your heart. And for the longest time, he was, he pretty much talked a lot. Let's be honest. He pretty much talked a lot. He did do that. But then when he got those powers, wow. When you think about it, he, he said it. He literally gains the powers to create evos. Everything from his bet Rex's best friend to completely innocent people. That is terrifying. Okay? And he's charismatic. He's leading freaking breach. But what was the wolf's name again? Uh I don't remember. It's been Beowulf a or something. Beowulf. Beowulf, oh. that was it. Oh yeah. And what was the fuck what was the thing with the lizard with a cloth with minerals for hand? Scalamander, that was it. Scalamander. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got, I have to confess, I did fall out with Rex after the whole time skip thing, but I'm thinking about picking it back up again just for, to see what they did with Kleiss. But yeah, that, those are my number eights. Wow. Uh, anyways, I believe it's Trey's turn. Yeah. No, it's you. Oh, right. Uh, Nate. Go, Nate. Nate the Well, great. time to bring in a Di- another Disney villain. Ooh. <laughs> you shouldn't have taken my little deal. Now you spend the rest of your life <gasps> being a slimy little frog. Oh, you, you son fucking... of a bitch. Oh, yeah, man. Dr. Facilier from The Princess and the Frog. Oh, my God. God. Motherfucker, Nate. No! <laughs> oh, Get out oh, of here, oh, right. <laughs> Show your face right now. Show your face right now. I want to see it. <laughs> Show your face. I loved that villain from the princess. I know. No. Oh, Are you ready? Are you Are ready? You ready? Yeah. Oh, you motherfucker. Oh, my God. I still can't believe that's the same voice as fucking Spawn. I know. First off, keep David. Oh, man. That was a great casting choice. And his singing voice was spot on. And I loved how when we saw him, he was just like a humble magician, but as it turns out, he's an expert in voodoo magic. And when he found out about Prince Naveen, he decided to take advantage of it. I'm glad I did an interesting twist with the old classic Prince Naveen in the Frog Fairy Tale. He really manipulated Naveen and that butler of his by turning Naveen into a frog, using the blood to turn the butler into Naveen. You think that he wanted to inherit the wealth, but turns out he had something even bigger. Fun fact about Voodoo, Larry. I can't conjure a thing for myself. It's like you said, the real power is money, especially when you look at today. Mm-hmm, definitely. And I think that Dr. Facilier, even though he does get his own hands dirty, he also gets help from his friends on the other side. That's his other end game goal to steal everyone's soul in New Orleans and be No, the no, no, it's not, to, it's not to steal everyone's soul, it's to take, pay off his debt so he doesn't get his taken. Oh yeah, that's true. It's called self-preservation. 
Yeah, and he was that close to succeeding. That close. He almost killed him. Oh, I can't remember, like, the Big Daddy's name. <laughs> he doesn't have one. Oh, yeah, that's true. But, oh, wow. Around the end, he almost convinced Tiana. He almost convinced her to join his side. And that final demise. Well, that's what happens when you mess with voodoo magic. Like, you got to pay for it. You got to pay for it with your own soul. I promise I'll pay you back. I promise. <laughs> Oh man, just seeing that defeat scene, who would have done his own theme song would be his own demise too, and wow. Again, I had to give props to Keith David. That was a really good performance that he did. Granted, he is a bit one note in some areas, which is why I could put him so low on my list, but even with that, he's such an entertaining villain. He's so charismatic, he's so suave, and he's very menacing. That's why I had to put Dr. Facilier for my number eight. Dr. Basilier is on your number eight, huh? Yeah, but... Am, it, I the, it, it, it. am I the only one pissed off that we didn't get that world in Kingdom Hearts 3? I agree. I know. But, but uh, also, but, Trey, got anything else to add for that? Because we've got to link on that one. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Honestly, I just... I like the pragmatism and the way he approaches this kind of thing differently. Because, like... Dr. Facilier, he's a very... Okay, usually when it comes to Disney villains, they usually have some kind of personal connection to the main characters, but he's an entirely outside context villain that just happens to take advantage of uh, Prince... Shit, I forgot his name. Prince Naveen. 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 Prince Naveen and his assistant's uh, apparent greed. and Lawrence. Just, uh, Lawrence, yes. He takes advantage of them and manages to pretty much just fuck up everything in the process. Which is just fantastic. Another little notice thing I noticed about, like, when I was watching the Are You Ready song on YouTube, was how I see in the comments section people pointing out that technically he doesn't really tell a lie in the movie. Oh, he was being he honest. He does not. He does not. He just bends and twists the truth of it, or just leaves out certain key details. And that's the true mark of a consman. You know, he doesn't lie, but he's not being straightforward with you either. Mm hmm. He's just messing with your mind. That's the whole thing about voodoo. Mm -hmm. And I also liked how in that sort of scene, we can see how good he is at reading these people. Because while Prince Naveen is all eager to see how this goes as the tourist he is, and Lawrence is the one that's skeptical, you can notice during the song that his true target really is Lawrence, you know? He takes advantage of Lawrence's very clear frustration being number two to Naveen. And Naveen, while he is entertained by this, he's not really, you know, into Sucker. making a deal because Exactly, because he already has Ooh, everything God. he ever needs, so why would he need anything else? And it's Lawrence who doesn't have anything that ends up becoming the sucker here. And that's fucking great, the way he was able to think that through the whole damn time. And it's so damn fitting that his friends on the other side end up becoming his enemies by the very end. You see his sheer desperation, and it's very cathartic when you see him picking on these weak little frogs, our main characters, just moments prior, only for him to end up becoming the prey again. It's yeah. really cool. And I kind of want, okay, you know what? Even the, Disney's making these movies for these villains. I, I hate to say it. I hate to say it because I know they probably fuck it up, but I kind of want to see a Dr. Facilier prequel. I do too. Yeah. I would totally uh, see that. I, I, I mean, if work. we get a Corella one, we could get one for Dr. Facilier. Exactly. Because, like, you just don't he, hire the same people who made that one. Right. Because it's like, he's not straight up villain, he's just a pragmatist willing to use other people's lives to save his own. He's a survivalist. So you can easily spin that for a very more anti-heroic or anti-villainous character like Disney wants to do. And it still fit in line with his portrayal in the mainstream movie. Just go up to when he made that deal and how he needs to repay his debt and shit. Yeah. Okay. Wow. I didn't know I, didn't know I was going to walk into that. <laughs> oh, my God. You missed that reaction when, he, when Trey said mental like, oh, man. I should have said, are you ready? For a mental link. Oh, my. yeah. <laughs> Eric, go on. Go ahead, Eric. So, Barry, uh, this whole finding my fun thing isn't working out, so I, now I just kind of want to get out of here. Archer, please, the boots are slipping. Yeah, I have a 200 pound asshole hanging off of my boots. 183, fat boy. What? Well, tell that to my silk socks. What? You have silk socks? Uh, is that a joke? <laughs>
<laughs> Barry, Barry Dillon from Archer. Of uh, <laughs> course. <laughs> okay. So literally the rivalry between Barry and Archer is literally just because Archer, the horn dog that he is, sodomized Barry's fiance. <laughs> he raped someone? Yeah, he ran through Barry's fiance and Barry will never let that go. And Archer will literally rub salt on, on that wound on Barry just to spite him. <laughs> Jesus fuck. <laughs> Like, Archer will even ask him in Russia. He's like, I don't know how would sodomizing my fiance. He's like, how about how would deliciously depraved describe it? <laughs> <laughs> Damn. So, what kind of escalates it is that Archer doesn't give a shit about Barry and he kind of just like laughs at Barry. Like, so that that that, that the quote that I just gave you earlier basically he lets Barry drop into a, a trash can in Russia he gets like most of his bones broken and he gets turned into a into a cyborg basically by the by the KGB and then it escalates when he did when Archer is getting married to Katya and then Barry just shows up at the wedding and kills Katya in front of Archer oh. is that how you crash a wedding yes it is bionic Barry yes it is so basically, like, what makes Barry entertaining is that he's fucking crazy, and he, he he's literally doing this. He's literally doing everything he does as like a as like a loose cannon because he has a hate boner for Archer. That's it. <laughs> oh my god! But 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 later on in in the more recent episodes, now that Archer's out of his coma, um, Barry actually does become Archer's friend. He visited him every day for the three years he was in a coma. Um, but he's but he's still entertaining. I still liked the I still miss the days when he was just hating on Archer and Archer was just spiting him. <laughs> okay. So yeah, Barry Dillon from Archer. <laughs> Dang, all right. Barry's gonna look at the sketch of okay, how am I gonna fuck up his life today? <laughs> all righty. So number seven, all righty. Time to go into uh... my first tie of this list. Oh, from two characters who are in the shadows, but fuck up some shit when they come on screen. The first one, you will know respect and pain will be your lesson, Prince Zuko. Oh, oh Fire Lord shit. Ozai from oh. Last Airbender. Oh, that guy. And Worst dad ever. So oh, that yeah. makes that makes oh, it really why a show Tucker would disagree with you on here's that. and but here's the guy who's tied with from the original series, not the other ones. I will punch you down, turn us out. No way, is that Bill Gax? Bill Gax. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the these two are just the villains working in the shadows, but when they come on screen, run, run away. Well, maybe run from Phil Gax. Fire Lord yeah. Ozai's kind of a pussy. Let's go with Fire oh, no, Lord. No, no, the fuck he ain't EDA. No, the fuck he ain't. <laughs> okay, catch any Brandon. Let's go with Fire Lord Ozai from the Last Airbender. My God, this show is great. It's godlike. This this guy, you don't know who he is, what he looks like. He's always in the shadows. His his face is always obscure. It wasn't until season three where we actually see his face when Zuko came home. And damn it, by all means, this is Mark one of Mark Hamill's best signature roles. Wait, wait, wait! Back the fuck up. That was Joker. Yeah, that, was yeah that was him. Wow. That explains it, huh? <laughs> this guy is just so... He worked his way around his own father to become the next Fire Lord. This just... He, the amount of hatred towards his brother, but also scarring his own son for life. And even manipulating Azula, too. The way he made Azula just freak out by the end of the the end of the series was just this girl's too far gone 
because of her father. Mm -hmm. But it's just how he he takes the ideas from other people. Like it, during the like the war meeting when Zuko had a flashback when he was actually by his father's side, he actually made his his reasoning almost sound accurate. The way he he said it, burning all of the of the of the Earth Kingdom down to the ground because because of Zuko said that they will never surrender because they have hope, and they use Sozin's calm to do it. And my God, when he when they use that power in the first first time we see it, Ooh. that in quote from Toph, that is a lot of fire because that is basically fire is at their peak. At the peak of their power. Love the fact that his third act beatdown in this case was him being thoroughly outclassed because that's all he cared about: mastering and power. If he, if he had actually paid attention to what Zuko was good at, he could have had an incredible assassin on his disposal. Yeah, he, he got too have. arrogant. But yeah, no, he was too no, he was too obsessed with fire bending prowess instead of actual skills. But it was also like the comics. The comics really elaborated more on his on his character after the defeats of after his defeats and how he lost the war. But yeah, Fire Lord Orzai will always be that memorable character. But let's go to the mad, crazy, alien hunter, Vilgax from Ben 10. Uh, uh, uh. Who better in Alien Force? Fight me. I don't know about that, buddy. I don't know about <laughs> that. But yes, how I said how Fire Lord Ozai was always in the shadows, so was Vilgax, mostly because he was getting repaired. <laughs> but when he came out on this, tell me you guys didn't freak out when he when he stepped out of that chamber and his red eyes were in in the background. Tell oh no, me I, I did kissed my pants. Uh, I wasn't about as terrifying as Trigon. My God, it's just so good. His, I thought his design before he was injured was cool, but after, when he got when he reconstructed. Boy. Holy crap! And we thought Asta got swole. Oh no! Yeah. Well, he's even more swole. Like those, like those, like joints giving him more muscles. <laughs> yeah, man. But no matter what happens, he always finds a way to cheat death, come back. Even when, like in the future, he was torn apart by Ben Ten Thousand, he came back and actually gave both Bens a run for their money because of how that much of a hatred he has for them. Mostly because of his grandpa, because he blew him up and almost killed him. Mm -hmm. He was probably uh, what um, Darkseid is to Superman, what he is to Ben Ten. Yes, but it's all. But also, I just also the video games made him really, actually, really interesting and, and a fun boss fight in some of the games. But I cannot excuse the fact this is also Steve Blum voicing the guy. Oh, and he's had hell of a voice acting career. Hugely. He has a huge resume. What are you talking about, Eric? Steve Blum just gives this guy that sense of he he thinks as he, as he when it goes along while he's like duking it out with Ben. Plus, can we just say like also the Ben Ten movie Race Against Time was also pretty good for how oh for yeah how they handled it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I love that movie. So yeah, two villains who work really well in the shadows: Fire Lord Ozai. And Vilgax share the spot number seven. Kevin. Well, Brandon, you talked about one cartoon arc villain. Let me bring another. And like like a lot of our shows, there are a lot of villains, but this one's really iconic. And he's very heated up. Hmm? Okay, it's a fire villain. Father. From codes named Kids. Father, you son Father. of a bitch. Oh, you mean Benedict Uno? Yep. <laughs> God damn that twist. Okay, I'll talk about the twist later, but yes, Father. I will not lie, I love fire, guys. I am a fire elemental, okay? Fight me. But Father, like, in a way, that he was pretty much like the Villagax or whatever of uh he was the Vilgax and Dark Side to the kids next door. He was in the shadow. He was always thinking. He was always sending his del the delightful children, children from, from down, down the lane. lane. Why the we fuck beat would they get 
that name. Like, what the Creepy fuck? Creepy fuckers. That's what they were. Yeah. Which is ironic, considering they were actually uh, Kids Next Door at one point. They were the antithesis of the Kids Next Door. Yes, and Father is basically their, in a way, their dark side, especially in season one. But when he comes on screen, for some fucking reason, using fire, like, the sh okay, let, let, let's just ignore the whole physics of the show, how they use powers. Let's just ignore that. The kids of that universe faked the moon landing and built the space station on the moon. Logic and physics. I know! No. <laughs> but still, Father, let, let, okay, okay. Let's talk about his design. He looks like a literal shadow. Okay? He's pretty badass. His and also I just love the fact he's always smoking and while in the in the shadow. It's just you you're just terrified. His voice just wow. What was his voice actor again? I forgot, but Oh, I got it. It's Maurice Mars. And for the other one, it's also Jeff Bennett too. He has two yeah, voice Jeff actors. Bennett. <laughs> yeah, but still he was good. And when during the near the season finale, when he actually started fighting, like guys, he took down all of Sector V. Like he kept taking them out, and it only took Ice Cream of all things to stop him. Still, I don't care. Like he just felt like a really good villain. Like of all the villains from the Kids Next Door, and I mean all the fucking villains, Father has always felt like the one that always pushed them. And then codenamed Kids Next Door, uh, uh, I think Operation Zero. Operation Zero. Man, he actually got some depth. Like, to, like the fact that he was Nigel Uno's uncle. Like, what the that fuck? I didn't see coming. It's a really welcome twist, though. I fucking love that twist. And I love the delightful children from down the lane's transformation into Sector Z, I believe. Oh, yeah, that was like, members of Sector cool. Z. No, it was insane, but yeah. it works. Yeah, but then also, remember when Father got pissed that Grandfather was actually talking shit over him? And he's just like, that, <laughs> that, that, Ah, oh, what the heck ah, screw it. I don't know. You can bow up have yourself, Monty. I'm going go back inside the house on my rocky road. I at the very like... least, he stood up to his grandfather and at least made his grandfather piss his pants. Yeah. Like we let, let's be real. If father wanted to, he could have kicked his grandfather's ass by himself. Yeah, yeah he could have. I just love that father is always a hilarious villain too. Like I think one of the episodes I remember is when everyone was trying to get the last of the cereal, and Nightbreak oh, the last one is like this sugary sweet. I would have destroyed. Yeah. And then father and uh, Nigel and, like uh, number one. And, shall we? Shall we put it to the side until breakfast is over? <laughs> My favorite episode with him would have to be when he nearly took over the entire Kids Next Door organization with a game of tag and box. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and oh, don't forget the fact that he actually had a device that turned the kids into animals. And two. Oh, that, that was, was actually good. Yeah. Like he turned every like that was good. So yeah, he's number seven because he's just that badass. Yes. Goddamn. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just remembering his funniest moments. Oh yeah, he's so funny. <laughs> I Go ahead, EA, what is your number seven? Well, hang on, I get... hang on, I need a lozenge. What lozenge? This is not... Now you know what's good. The time has come to wipe humanity from the face of Sugar Zoom. Let the oh. war between the living and the dead what? Yes! The Skeleton King from Monkey Team. Because I am not saying that full fucking title. You are not the only one. Super Robot Monkey Team. Super Robot Monkey Team. Have the force go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah, that. I love that cartoon. I love it too. Another right? role. And what is Skeleton 2? Like he, man, huh? What were you going to say, Trey? I was gonna say the show that was led, the show where Beast Boy was finally team leader. <laughs> oh yeah! Get out of here, Trey. <laughs> and that show was what happened if somebody took Beast Boy and Cyborg, put them in a blender, and then split it up into a show. Yeah, because oh, that's essentially what that show was. I mean, my. Okay, let's first of all talk about his design. Oh. Season one was that just lanky figure. With that crack in the skull. Oh, it's, and then of course that panel. I don't get it. I guess they were trying to go for the Darth Vader look. Maybe. Beats, beats me. 
but it still looks good. Like it looks oh, yeah. like an actual skeleton. But also his oh, organs. Yeah. You see his oh, organs, man. Oh no, no, no. Jeez. I will admit the worm thing was a bit weird. I don't get it. But then when we learn about his backstory. Oh yeah. Oh, dude. I mean, you want to talk about a fall from grace. He literally made the monkey team. But then he fooled around with powers that he shouldn't have touched with, and he was cursed. And mm -hmm. basically became a servant. And since then, the point, his whole existence is just destroy everything and let the dark gods take over. And god damn it. I mean, first of all, he intimidated Mandarin. Who was probably a very, very close secondary contender for this spot? Oh, hell, mm. hell, he even, hell, he was like, Yeah, no, you fucked up one too many times. You're gonna get replaced. And then he literally replaced him with a clone. Yeah. <laughs> That's fucked up. <gasps> but my God, I, my personal favorite thing about it, when he returns. Yes, he was resurrected. Oh, oh yeah. Oh. And first, first of all, the crystal skull is creepy. Let's just get that out of the way. Oh, Eat your heart yeah. out, Indiana Jones. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then when you see him actually get resurrected, it's, ugh, yeah. it's uncomfortable. This is, this is on cartoon. This is a cartoon for kids. Yeah, I know. I it's swear, uncomfortable. The cartoons we mentioned, they have a lot of dark shit. Yeah, that's, that's why we grew up tough, because we don't know how to deal with this shit. We're not sensitive about it. <laughs> and then after his resurrection, the first thing he does just holds out his hand, wipes out the team, wipes oh. him out. This, he completely one-shots the girl, the robot girl, whatever the heck it was. And then he wipes out the woman who responsible for his resurrection. He's like, yeah, now this world is mine. Raises yep. an undead army. Oh, an, ar an undead army is always going to be terrifying. An undead army raised by a, what is basically amounts to a warlock, it's even scarier. But damn it, they why did we? Correct. I know, I know. Why did we never get a full conclusion? And that would have been a fantastic. We could have gotten a great one, motherfuckers. Because Jedi's got canceled because it was yeah. dumb. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's why I can only end it like that. Motherfucking never got a proper ending. Hey, you got my respect, now? though. You got my respect. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, Skeleton King is a good choice. Yes. Nate, what is your number eight? Seven. We're at seven. seven. Yeah, we're at seven. But anyways, because the Packers are owned by the city of Green Bay and they won't sell it to me. <sighs> yeah, what? it's Vlad from Danny Phantom. Oh, oh yeah, that Vlad quote Vlad. where he shouted like that. Oh, man. That episode, that. that, that when he said that quote, that just made me laugh. <laughs> like, of all things, he just... I'm honest to God surprised, really. Yeah. I'm glad it's a great villain, but I'm honestly surprised you're ignoring the real true greatest villain, but we can get to that later. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's like Brandon said. He's like a dark mirror of Danny Phantom. Like, he used to be friends with Danny's parents, but after the accident and after gaining that power, he just became corrupt. Yeah, like Brandon said, he's pretty basic, but even then, he still knows how to be an intimidating villain. And there are times where he does chew up the scenery with his comedic timing. <laughs> oh, wait, I actually do have a question. Was there ever a moment in a show where Danny was able to beat him in a straight-up fair fight? Hmm, I don't think so. It, it just shows how powerful Vlad is. It's... And all the other encounters that they have, and all the plans that he has done, it actually shows that he's a very cunning villain. Definitely one of the more intimidating ones out of Danny Phantom's roster. And yeah, again, I was so pissed about the finale. I can't believe they copped out like that. <sighs> but even with that, I still remember Vlad very well. But anyway, I can't add much since Brandon already covered most of it. But yeah, Vlad, he's definitely one of my favorite Nickelodeon villains. Number seven. All right, Trey. Number seven, buddy. 
I know you want to be happy, but you won't be, and I'm sorry. It's not just you, you know, your father and I, we, well, we come by it honestly, the ugliness inside you. You were born broken. That's your birthright. And now you can fill your life with projects, your books, and your movies, and your little girlfriends, but it won't make you whole. Bo You're Bojack Horseman. There's no cure for that. The fuck? Oh. If we it? had a contender for worst father, Beatrice Horseman is the contender for worst mother. Oh. Yes. Oh. Yes. The mom that had Alzheimer's? Yes, from Bojack Horseman. Okay, then. Oh, that is actually God. pretty bad. Yeah. Now, Beatrice is probably the most, let's just say, complicated character in the whole series of Bojack Horseman. And that's a feat considering the rest of the cast, especially Bojack himself. Hugely. Because she start because like all you hear from her throughout season one is just stories and flashbacks of her being a shitty mother to Bojack. And there's no and we see it for ourselves. Like we see a flashback of when Bojack first smokes a cigarette and she's like, I want you to smoke it all. And he's like, are you punishing me for being bad? And her response is, I'm punishing you for being alive. And that's like, it comes off as cartoonishly evil. But the more you go across the series, it's like, yeah, no, this makes sense for this character. And she's the level of toxic where she's not always directly abusive, but she always says the right things to just get the fuck under her, uh, Bojack's skin. Like, always pins the blame on him, no matter what. The divorce between her and her father, uh, never taking responsibility for her own toxicity, and et cetera, et cetera, despite being aware of it. She truly believes that her family is just a broken mess and that Bojack is just a product of their broken mess and that he deserves no real happiness like the rest of them. Like, Bojack himself said it best that they were all drowning together and there were very brief moments when it felt like they could swim. And when you see her backstory, that was fucking harsh. Like, it was bad. It was, oh my God. And what hurt was, it was how real it was. Like, at that, like when I first watched it, I've heard about how men used to lobotomize women, but to actually see a depiction of that mm -hmm. in a fucking sick, animated sitcom of all, all things, to see that happen to her mother, to see Beatrice in an innocent position, and as she grows up, while she was somewhat entitled, she wasn't nearly as bad as we see her grow up to be. And then it just goes downhill when she meets, shit, I forgot Bojack's father's name. I but, forgot too. Yeah, but him, when she meets him and it just becomes like a broken fucking family, just based off of a fucking mistake. She never intended to get pregnant with a total stranger, but it happened and they just have to fucking live with it. And it sucks though. But the real tragedy is the fact that the only good moment Bojack had with her was when she had Alzheimer's, when she wasn't aware, when she wasn't being toxic because she just wasn't mentally capable of being herself in that moment. And the fact that she died without having said the, uh, the three words that Bojack wanted to hear, I love you at all during out their entire life. And yeah. the fact that the possibility that she wasn't saying anything meaningful, that she was just so dazed out of it, she was reading the fucking sign of the ICU, that she wasn't even saying her last words to Bojack. Her fuck, I don't fucking know. I don't know, man, either. Uh, it's these, I don't hate her. Like, even though I reason we should. Alzheimer's, it's not a pretty picture. Exactly. And it's like, yeah. She's just a character. When you think about her, you're filled with a multitude of feelings you just don't know how to describe because of just how fucking real she is. And that's why she's at number seven, honestly. Also because like she kind of steers a line between just being a commentary and a straight up villain. Fair enough. Fair this enough. This just man. got fucking depressing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. That's yeah, Gary right. Trey. Bojack Horseman is always depressing. It that's is. why I don't I, watch wait, it. I'm, I'm going to give you a high five for mentioning Bojack, my brother. Well, I'm hopefully my number seven can lighten the mood. Please, it's your turn, buddy. We'll, we'll see. Got? Okay, so here's the universe of where I set my number seven in. <laughs> oh my fucking god! <laughs> yep, but I'm not talking about Beavis and Butthead. No, they're not the villains of that I'm talking about. This is the villain. Oh, 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 oh. 
Are you oh, kidding dude. me? Oh, oh, oh. Seriously, dude. <laughs> what? what? Yep. Principal McVicker is my number seven. I'm just going to turn off the mic. Uh, I don't this. even know who he's talking about. <laughs> speaking of speaking of villain that borders on commentary and just straight up satire. <laughs> Principal oh, McVicker is my number seven. Okay, from okay. Beavis and Butthead. So, so, in Beavis and Butthead, you're looking at it from the perspective of two delinquents in high, Highland High School in like Texas somewhere, and then Principal McVicker is the old. It's like the more human is like the more real. He's like a very grounded set of uh, representation of like, the absolute abuse of authority. Like, okay, everybody hates Beavis and Butthead. They think they're like like worse than dirt. I get that because <laughs> they're delinquents. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, they are. But but McVicker expresses it in like the most abusive way. Like like, he, he, like what was it? I was even looking up his crimes earlier. Um, getting ready for number seven. He's even like issued death. He's even like spoken death threats against his butthead. Like Jesus Christ. I was even I was even debating between making between him or or Buzzcut, who's like. But no, Buzzka is just like a pawn of McVicker. McVicker's just a straight up asshole. Like, especially in the um like in the episode when when Bill Clinton was supposed to show up and visit, he straight up told the Secret Service, like lied to them under perjury, that they're not <coughs> students. They're armed and dangerous. And then when he found out and he gave him a pass in that episode to like just stay the hell away from campus. So they don't meet the president. But when he found out they were on campus, he just loses shit and starts running towards them in the gym. He's like, grab him, grab him, get beat the crap out of him. And then the Secret Service just tackles him ironically. Oh my. That was so stupid, but. Score one for the Secret Cervix. <laughs> so, so, but the worst, the worst. Is the last episode in the 90s. Oh, the oh 90s I think run. I know what you're when talking Be about. When Beavis and Butthead are declared dead, McVicker is proud of it. He's proud of it. And he's even lied on broadcast saying that there's like a whole jar of like change or whatever that he would gladly give all the money to them just to see Beavis and Butthead one last time. I'm like, I'm like, that is such an asshole thing to do. But the minute, the minute they show up again and try to take the jar, McVicker's like, Freaking the fuck out, and then he just has a heart attack. <laughs> what do you know? Talking about like a death speech, and ends up leading to his own death. Exactly. And then Beavis and Butthead were like laughing at him, like, "Hey, Beavis, you see McDecker?" He was like, "Oh!" And then Buzzcut kissed him. Yeah, that was cool. We should go to school tomorrow. You know, in case someone else dies. You dumbass. We're rich. We don't have to go to school ever again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's damn cool. <laughs> so yeah, number seven, Principal McVicker from Beavis and Butthead, voiced by Mike Judge. <laughs> oh my god. That... Kevin, <laughs> we need Beavis and Butthead to appear in an episode of King of the Hill. Dude, yes! I fucking hate both those shows. Fuck off. What are you doing, King of the Hill? <laughs> I don't like Beavis and Butthead. I don't like King of the Hills. I do not like Bojack Horseman. I do not. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Damn, going, you're so what's going on? Tasting... <laughs> <laughs> okay, number six, go. Number uh, six, go. six for me. This one was definitely what got me into like a lot of the uh, when my dad showed me some of the cartoons he was growing up in the uh, early days. Ancient gods transform this broken corpse to Mon Ra. The ever living what thunder raw from Thundercats. Oh, thunder, 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 thunder cats. Oh. <laughs> Still not yes. better than He Man, though. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Mum Raw from Thundercats is just—he was probably back in the day one of the creepiest cartoon villains that they made. This guy is a literal, like, walking bandaged corpse. It wasn't until he gets the power from the old gods of sorcery that he actually becomes, like, this, like, muscular, like, Aztec, as undead Aztec king. 
no matter what he does, like the Thundercats always have a problem with this guy. He he literally can beat them one on one or as a group by himself. He is that powerful. Oh my God, it is just so dang just good how they actually captured the idea of him being an idea of black magic sorcery in like an old decrepit form. I don't know if any, any other like cartoon villains actually have like something to do with like sorcery or something. I don't know why that we, we get a lot of those in, in there now these days, but Mum Ra was the very first one, especially the man's voice in oh, that, that cartoon. It go it goes from like just old decrepit to like big and powerful booming voice when he gets that power upgrade. And who maybe People still think, yeah, which is better, Thundercats or He-Man? I don't really care because I still like both those shows. Both of them are good in their own ways. So, and don't watch the, f uh, what the fuck happened with them and the reboot of Thundercats. What the oh. fuck was that? Do you okay, think that's so worse than the She-Ra Netflix series? Yes, it is, because they totally did a freaking 180 on, <laughs> on, the, on the series. Yeah, because at least She-Ra, at least it has some consistency with some villains. But it's also, but it's also, I think, I think there was another, there was another Thundercats series after the '80s one, and it wasn't the one that's on now. But I think it was like something in the early 2000s. I could be wrong, but yeah, yeah another one to come out. But Kevin, first up, fuck you, and Brandon, don't you dare be, uh, be the equal, tolerant, common sense-minded fan. You need to be toxic and choose a side. Nah, I'm not going to. My list, motherfucker. <laughs> that Trey furry piece of shit. So yeah, Mum Ra is my number six spot. So I, I was, I'll, 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 I, I do get you what you mean, Trey, and I. You'll probably be surprised who's higher on my list. <laughs> oh, so, uh, anyway, your turn, Kevin. Yeah, for number six. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just laughing at the fact that Trey said "fuck you," Kevin. Oh man, all right. <clears throat> so this is my uh, second tie. Okay. Oh, yes. And they are both comic characters. And their animations are pretty good. For the first one, face the master of magnetism. Magneto from X-Men Evolution. Oh, Evolution, that's a good iteration. I love Evolution. And the second one, he's the time-traveling wanderer death, who has a mission to kill Captain America, Kang the Conqueror. Oh, okay. oh, that arc was so good. Yes, yes. T yep, two Marvels. Sorry, DC. <laughs> You're later on. But yes, badass, this uh, one badass villain, one kind of overrated anti villain. Let's go. Well, fuck. You know what? He's right. He's actually right. He's, <laughs> he's, not, he's, right. he's not wrong. He's right. So, Trey, go fuck yourself. Furry. Anyways, um, I'm just kidding. Um, so I'll start with Magneto. <laughs> Because, yes, he's overrated. Yes, he's always been depicted as a villain or anti-villain in a lot of Marvel uh, series. But Evolution, they did all right with him. I mean, it, like, he was the Shadow Master in the first season. You know, he was always behind the strings. His armor design, though, let's admit yeah. it. Was cool. That was a really good design. <laughs> I know. It just felt interesting you know it felt really cool to see this character just be the this devil in a sense and then when he finally fights dude he's overpowered i mean he has a meteor as a base meteor m that's awesome it's crazy but still it's just it's just great you know like he overpowered all the x-men he even had this machine that actually amplified the mutant gene you know giving them more strength which he was going to use on himself. He even used on Sabretooth, Mystique, and the Summers uh, brothers. It was pretty good. And then season two onward, he started being more villainous because he had his own group, the Acolytes, which was um, pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. I, I like the Acolytes. You know, Gambit, Pyro, Sabretooth, and Colossus. That's cool. And he always tried to prove mutant su supremacy, as usual, in every fucking iteration. Which is overrated, but still, he did venture that line between anti-villain when he did help the heroes at some point, especially during Apocalypse, where he kind of became a horseman of Apocalypse. That's what we see his potential. Like, goddamn, oh. like fuck, 
Fuck the X Men live action series. This Magneto is so powered as well. But it's just like I like that he wasn't bad. Like we actually again we see his backstory <laughs> as you know just a Jew, a little Jewish boy in World War II. You know we understood why he was like that, and in some sense he had honor. Like remember that episode where Wolverine tried to stop uh, the Super Soldier Project again because of Captain America. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Eric was just using that. Well, not our Eric, but Eric Lent- Lencher. He was trying to use it to live. You know, he was dying. So when Nightcrawler saved him, uh, let him live, he decided, you know what? I'm not going to kill. I could kill these guys. They helped me, though. That's fine. So he let them live. Although, what they did to Scarlet Witch. Fuck oh, him. Man. Fucking oh, full heart for that. Man. Fuck him. Yeah, that was very. That kind of killed a lot of redemption for him, but still, he was a good villain. Good antithesis to the X Men. Honestly, I should have chosen another version of him, but still, I like this one because I'm more familiar. Because X Men Evolution is a good cartoon. Let's all. Oh that. yeah, hugely. Really oh cartoon. yeah. And now let's talk about Kang. Kang, Kang, Kang. First of all, you don't get the name Conqueror. Kang, so Kang, Kang. You just the Kang, Kang. Just to Kang that I can. Oh, fuck. <laughs> You heard Dying Hippo with an annoying voice called Nicholas. Anyways, um, Kang... Oh, you know what? I was called a whale once, so I'll take a wet hippo. Okay, that's enough. All right, but yeah. Goddamn, Kang was overpowered. I mean, the guy came to the Avengers base for one mission. Kill Captain America. God, and, like, his powers of time manipulation, teleportation, he was able to hold off the Avengers for a good while. And then he decided to show them, guys, this is the future. Everything's fucked up. Although, kind of blaming that all on Cap is kind of messed up. We do understand that he is trying to fix a broken future, especially with his wife in a kind of stasis, which was interesting, you know? I mean, that kind of gave him a little par- a di- like a little third dimension, because he's not a bad guy. He's just misguided. And by misguided, I mean he's fucking crazy. Trying to change and the corrupt pool. too. Oh yeah, like remember the episode where he caused all the Avengers to go, I think, forward in time or something. Yep. Yeah, and he had to fight the new Avengers. You know, Spider-Man, Wolverine, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, War Machine, and for some reason, the Thing. Oh that yeah, was, well, they I all got captured. Episode. I liked that episode. <laughs> it was a good episode because it showed that King had issues. You know, he he had a plan, yet he didn't expect Tony to have a plan. I just like Kang's design, his powers, and just kind of the reason he's doing this. Still, don't fuck yourself, Kang. And hopefully they don't fu- the MCU doesn't fuck you over like they did with Loki. Cause, I mean, I like L- Kang's version in Loki. I just don't like Loki as a show in general. <laughs> it's not good. It, yeah, even as a Loki fan, that show bores me. <laughs> Ooh, that sucks. But yes, my Nito and Kang the Conqueror are tied in my list. Alrighty. Thank you. Go ahead, EDA. What is your number six? All right. Uh, let's go to a different type of comic villain. Well, technically not even a comic villain. He was he was created specifically for the sixth season. Sixth season? Yeah. Hey, I'm thinking. What show is this? Shokanaba from Fast Forward. Ninja oh, Turtles? Turtles? Yeah. Ninja Turtles oh. fast forward. Shoken oh, yeah. out when they were here. That one. Wait, that there were six one. seasons of that show? Yeah, there was like oh, more seasons of it. There was like eight, six, actually. Yeah, then it got canceled after the halfway mark of the eighth season. Yeah, oh, because shit. of like four kids. Right, because of a new version or whatever. <laughs> okay, first of all, let's just talk about his design. The thing, the guy is terrifying. He's basically what would happen if somebody looked at Venom, looked at armor, and thought, I must combine these two. Oh. And it's pretty damn effective. Yeah. His entire species is basically just parasites that feed off planet after planet. But when he gets to Earth, he realizes, oh, wait, the sun... He doesn't know at first, but he's like, oh, and then he realizes the sun is fucking with me. So what does he do? He decides to blot out the sun. <laughs> the guy is insane. I mean, not only is he, like, meticulously <laughs> strong, he's also incredibly smart. Creating a living virus, mm-hmm. and not to mention the dark turtles. 
Yeah, but, right. Yeah, look, let's just be honest. The Dork Turtles were fucking creepy. Let's be 100% honest. They were mm-hmm. creepy. <laughs> and yeah, listen, he's on this list above all the other ones from that show because he actually had a complete story on it. We saw mm-hmm. his beginning, the middle, and his defeat. Well, I say defeat. It was more like he was vaporized by the sun grenade. <laughs> yeah. That's more wow. like a death than a defeat. It was. It really was. It, every time he spread his... Uh, I don't know how to phrase this properly, but every time he infected somebody or something, that metamorphosis... Oh, <laughs> mutated. Uh. Yeah, no good. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, wait, oh, wait, oh, wait, wait. Yeah, Shokanabo. No, Discount Venom is number six. <laughs> <laughs> oh, am I wrong? You're not wrong. I'm just... Am I wrong? wrong. You're not wrong. Go ahead, Nate. What do you got? Well, finally, I get to talk about a tie. <laughs> Okay. Trey mentioned one Pixar villain, so I'm going to talk about two of my personal favorites. The first one, you lost little doggy. Lotso from Toy Story 3. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, that guy. Oh, no. And the second one, let's just think about the logic, shall we? Let's just think about it for a second. If it was up there, would I be coming down here to your level looking for it? Oh, even though I, I remember, know that one. Yeah, even though Kevin Spacey did kind of drop down here after all allegations, I remember him as Hopper from A Bug's Life. Yep. Oh, oh shit! Bug's Life! Yep. And you also missed the other one, Kevin. It was lots of from Toy Story 3, so... Lots <laughs> of! Yeah. Two of some of my other favorite Pixar villains other than Syndrome. <laughs> I'm going to start things off with Lotso. Let's be fair here. When we all started Toy Story 3, none of us saw it coming. None of us saw Lotso as a villain. Nope. Because literally, when we first saw him, he was very generous. He was very friendly. He actually showed the Wood- Woody and the gang all around Sunnyside daycare. He showed him around the butterfly room. He showed him around the caterpillar room. And when Buzz requested it to be transferred, he did accept it. He did accept it. All right. But then that one line that picked him off. Family man, huh? I understand. Put him back in the timeout chair. And that's when his true color started to show. And he decided to use Buzz at his own pawn, setting him from play to demo. Because that teddy bear was actually in charge of Sunnyside Daycare and turning into a freaking prison game. It's like... I might get demonetized for this one, but it's literally like the Holocaust, but with toys, if you think about it. And his backstory. Oh, man. It was also, like, pretty sad, but it's also very misunderstood when his owner replaced him. And it's not... And it's only him. Daisy didn't replace Chuckles. Didn't replace Big Baby. Only Lotso. And Lotso got the wrong impression, and it corrupted him. He may even have that one side track that think that all toys are trash. And as the movie progresses, we get to see him be nastier and nastier. And when Woody confronted him about Daisy, he snapped. He broke the locket that Big Baby used to have and threatens everyone. He's like, we're all just trash. We're all made to be thrown away. That's all a toy is. And when we get to see him get thrown into the dumpster, you think that was the end, right? We, th- But no, it gets even worse. No, he pulled an evil dead. I know. When he got stuck, Woody and Buzz, out of the kindness of their hearts, helped Lotso. And when they were about to be burned, Lotso had the chance to return to favor. But what does he do? Where's your kid now, Sheriff? What a piece of shit. I know, he let the toys to die and he was that close to succeeding that act alone separate him from sid and sticky pete as villains he's actually the most twisted out of all the toy story villains but 
you know what would have made him more threatening? <laughs> if he would have pulled a Stinky Pete and threatened to tear them apart, like what Stinky Pete did to Woody in Toy Story 2, that would have been more threatening. And how I ride that his defeat came tied up to a garbage truck. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, literally the only good thing I can say about Lotso is that he smells like strawberries. That's like the only good thing about him. <laughs> But enough about a teddy bear. Let's talk about a mean grasshopper. Yeah. Oh man, Hopper. When he first appeared, we all know that he's a threatening creature. Bullying the ants just so he can get the food. And when he summoned Thumper, he actually tried to give a Don to Thumper. He literally tried to give a little girl to a crazy killing grasshopper. What the hell? And when he saw one of the ants fall in line, what does he do? It seems that you ants are forgetting your place. So let's double the order. He decided to put them through full on labor. And it's very fitting considering a bug's life is based on the old fable, the ant and the grasshopper, where the grasshoppers are lazy. And also <laughs> similar to and also similar to ants, there are some almost Marxist and communist resonances. Oh, yeah, exactly. And Hopper definitely catches that very well, because even around in the hideout, it does feel like he's trying to have like a good time. It's like, guys, order another round, because we're staying here. And it does show us like he was having fun throwing grains at like the two ants that tried to trick them. He was just having fun. And was like, well, how about, how about this? this? <laughs> that was that dead silence just really worked. And he said, it's not about food, it's about keeping the ants in line because he's afraid that they might outnumber him. And when he came back and took over the island, whoa, he was that close to succeeding. He was that close. Yep, full-blown Stalinism. Yeah, but he failed after realizing that Flick actually encouraged everybody. And let me just say, his death scene is totally no. worth it. I totally got, worth it. I know. I got scarred as a kid when I saw that. And to make it worse, there are three baby birds. So it's yeah. likely he got torn to three. One of them is named Tweety. <laughs> God damn it, Eric. Like, yeah, like, you know, I love Kevin Spacey in the role for The Fugitive and as John Doe. I also love his role as Hopper because he was able to capture the entertaining part while being threatening at the same time. Oh. <sighs> but yeah, even though Kevin Spacey did hit rock down after the whole allegation things, but it still didn't take away the fact that I love Hopper as a villain. So yeah, Hopper and Lotso, two of my favorite Pixar villains sharing the same spot. All righty. Trey, what do you got for number six? The pastiest motherfucker in Ben 10 alive. Oh. The scare, aka Ghost Freak from Ben 10. <gasps> Ghost Freak? Oh, Freak. <laughs> you motherfucker. I love Ghost Freak. Wow. Oh. Another surprise villain that honestly none of us actually saw coming. Like the very idea, the concept that the DNA of some of these aliens is still alive within the watch and that they've managed to gain sentience and start to try to fight for control, that was terrifying on its own. But the fact that they chose what was the scariest alien Ben had at the time to represent that idea, dear Lord. And up to that point, Ghost Freak was actually one of my favorite aliens Ben 10 used. Same. He was awesome. Exactly. But I will admit this, that Ben, seeing how powerful Ghost Freak really is, Ben really hasn't been using him properly. No. Well, technically, has he, has he used any of his aliens properly, though, when he was younger? Not really, no. But when we see Ghost Freak's true potential fun display, when he takes out those carnies, it's like, oh, shit, Ben could legitimately murder so many people as Ghost Freak. Mm-hmm. And the sheer trouble that Ghost Freak still manages to cause us throughout the series, recruiting these horror movie villains like uh, the fucking wolf and yeah, the mummy, the wolf. Oh, and even Frankenstein for his return, it's like, what are all these three villains doing together? And I'm, as a kid, like, 
I hate myself that I wasn't able to put it get put it together sooner. Of course, Ghost Freak is behind all these horrible <laughs> aliens coming together to bring them back. Because like, who else but the original Ghost himself? Mm -hmm. Oh, now don't tell me you're afraid of all the Ghost Freaks. Boo. <laughs> it was also okay. Let's be. Let's be honest, that scene scared everybody. And he was still technically a good guy in that. Yes. Yeah. Yes, he was. And you know what? I feel like it was kind of hinted at because Ben did kind of act a little bit more sadistic whenever he was a ghost freak. True, yeah, like, but not but not till not till later when we actually see like we actually got a glimpse of his true form when he, when he opened up his uh, his chest. Right. And he killed that clown. Well, nearly killed. Him. Nearly. Yeah, but still, I'm like, what the fuck? I want to see what's on the other side now. I don't think you do. Like, but it, I mean, we got we got basically an idea. His true form when we saw it. Um, uh, oh, and also him returning in Ultimate Alien. As oh, mixed yeah. bag as Ultimate <laughs> Alien is, him nearly taking over all of Bill Gax's plan, forcing Bill Gax to form an alliance with Ben 10, and forcing Ben to reabsorb him into the Omnitrix and nearly win. <laughs> is he legit? That was fucking scary. And Ben's arrogance nearly killed his ass right there. That's mm -hmm. No kidding. Uh, I'm mixed about his return in Omnivores, though. I feel like he should have ended in Ultimate Alien, if that makes sense. Everything should have ended after Ultimate Alien. I mean, I do not know. talk about those last two. Hey, look, I like Gravitech and Rook, okay? So I don't know how to feel about <laughs> that, but... <laughs> I don't know but, about you right now. Either way, though, Ghost Freak, a very iconic villain from Ben 10, and honestly rivals the likes of Vilgax and the Hybrid in just in terms of the sheer threat and limits they managed to push Ben throughout the series. That is true. You got my respect, buddy. God damn. damn. God I was damn. not expecting Ghost Freak. <laughs> and plus, Steve Bloom. Again. Oh, shit, he was Ghost Freak? Yeah. Yeah, yeah both wow. Ghost Freak and Heat Blast and also Vilgax. Yep. Damn. Again, huge resume. Eric, what do you got for number six, dude? You know what the central finite curve is? They built a world on infinity, separating all the infinite universes from all the infinite I'm universes where he's the smartest man in the universe. Every version of us has spent every version of all our lives in one infinite crib built around an infinite fucking baby. And I'm leaving it. That's what makes me evil, being sick of him. If you've ever been sick of him, you've been evil too. Evil Morty. Yeah. I hope you die in a hellhole, evil Morty. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> Am I the only one excited for season six? Oh, That's hell right. yes. Hell yeah. New multiverse, no portal gun. Rick with his back against the wall for the first Wait. time. Oh, hell yeah. no portal gun? We're not yes. Gonna, we're not going to see season six until like 2023. They always release the season every two years. We'll be ready. You know, you know what that says? That says quality over quantity. That's fair. Um, but yeah, Evil Morty. I would say, okay, so what Trey said about I hope you die in a hole, Evil Morty, that's what I said about him in season three. Like, what he did when he took over the Citadel was, what the fuck did he just do? <laughs> <laughs> that came out of nowhere. That's the crazy part. Like, I mean, he murdered every Morty that didn't, like, believe in his ideology. Like, Jesus, that's, like, extreme for him. Like, that, like, outdoes anything, like, sadistic or evil Rick's ever done. Ugh. But anywho, yeah, he... He's like the one Morty that actually broke free of his uh, of his tied wreck, and then and then he decided to do something about it. Because if you think about it, through the C one thirty seven Rick and Morty, through sheer dominance, yes, Rick is like almost mean and domineering to Morty, but and and like for all the Mortys to have to kind of live with that reality, especially in Rick counters of the Rick kind in season one, mm -hmm. basically, it's almost like the Mortys were just there for. The Mortys are just there just to be the subservient companion. If you had to live with that kind of existence when there are infinite Ricks and infinite Mortys, that in and of itself means that your existence is futile. So it's like this evil Morty is like, he somehow managed to, in a way, break that cycle and then decided to take control and even, even surpass what all the evil that the Ricks have done. Like, Jesus God. 
Yeah. But literally, like when season, but then when season five comes in, that was such a great finale and great. Oh, man. Um, he his motivation seems almost sympathetic in a way. I mean, what I mean, if you had to go through this this, this like recurring cycle, would you want to live through that? No, you try to find a break it. So and then he did. He he destroyed the citadel. He he used the. Um, what was it? The Operation Phoenix blood or whatever, just to rocket himself into, just to rock himself like out of this universe, and then just the possibilities were endless for him. Mm. Damn. But and plus, let's be perfectly honest here. Evil Morty is the proves that there were actually there are lists, and also let's be perfectly honest. There are at least a few other villains that are proved they're worse than Rick. Like Mr. Jelly, but that would have been too easy. <laughs> but even uh, uh, even more is the fucking worst. Like holy hell! He literally takes, um, like I understand his uh, argument and stuff like that, but he literally takes everything, every method, every ideal that Rick and every Morty has done thus far, and amplifies just the sheer depravity and disgustingness of it to like eleven to get his goals. After after. I mean, especially after a long time of living with the reality that his uh, existence is meaningless. So it's like, what does it matter if I sink to a lower level than Rick? As long so, as long right. so, so in a way, if you think about it, the Morty that we've been following tells us things about the other Mortys. Because like, even even Evil Morty acknowledges it. If you've been sick of him, you've been evil too. Yeah. Yeah. No, literally, almost every episode where Morty kind of gets sick of Rick, fucked up shit happens. But yeah, um, number six, Evil, Evil Morty. All righty. So we're going to take a little bit of a break of, from this uh, part one, and we'll go into part two in just a little bit. Be right back, guys. <laughs> 